Hello and welcome to the Cutting Room Floor Bible Study. I'm Reverend Joshua Thomas here at New Psalmist Baptist Church and we are so excited about sharing in this Bible study lesson with you today. So as you know, we practice click evangelism here at New Psalmist. I need you to do me a quick favor. I want you to share this link out to at least 10 people in your contact list, in your text threads, on your Facebook page, on your Instagram page, in your story. Let somebody know that it's time for Bible study here at New Psalmist. We're going to continue looking through where we left off in the sermon on this past Sunday from the book of Acts chapter 1. It's going to be an exciting lesson, informative lesson, and we want as many persons as possible to be a part of Bible study today as we grow in the Word. We have a command as Christians to always grow, to always learn, to know more about our tool, which is the Bible. That's where we get our understanding of who God is and his instructions for our lives. And the only way to grow in your understanding and your faith is to study the word. We have the word and no matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how long you've been in Bible study or in church, there's still something to learn in God's word. I know every time I pick up my Bible, every time I open up my Bible app, there's something that I learned. And so today in Bible study, I pray that there'll be something shared that helps you, that blesses you, that gives you new insight that you may not have had before, that helps you on your Christian journey. Now, as everyone is coming in, a few things I want to share with you today as we prepare for our Bible study lesson. On Pentecost Sunday, the first Sunday in the month of June, it's going to be an exciting day here at New Psalmist. And we are on that day, we're holding a baptism in our morning worship service. On Easter Sunday, we baptized over 80 persons right in the morning service. It was a tremendous witness, a tremendous opportunity for persons to see those who had made a decision for Jesus Christ go down in the water right in the main sanctuary right on Easter Sunday morning. And we're having our next baptism on Pentecost Sunday. So if you want to be baptized or anyone in your family wants to be baptized or you say, preacher, I, I, I was baptized at a young age, but I want to make a public declaration for myself. My parents encouraged me to get baptized. For some in church, your parents made you get baptized. And now you're saying, I want to make this decision to get baptized on my own. I want to rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. I want you to go to our church center site, newsalmist.churchcenter.com. Click right on baptism and you can register for baptism on Pentecost Sunday right as a part of our 9 a.m. worship service. And also, we have some special things happening right here at the church on May the 28th. Not this Saturday, but next Saturday. We have our men's breakfast with Bishop at 9 a.m. on the 28th. The first time we've been able to gather in person for our men's breakfast since 2020. February of 2020 was the last time we gathered in person for our men's breakfast that we have each and every month. We've been on Zoom for two years, and now we're coming back to the building on May the 28th at 9 a.m. Brothers, you can register on our website or church center site, newsalmist.churchcenter.com. Sign up to be a part of the in-person portion of the breakfast. And if you're from out of town or you would still like to join in for our brothers that can't come here physically, we'll be on Zoom as well. Then for all of our ladies on the 28th, while the brothers are in for their monthly class with Bishop, our ladies will be out on our property walking for our Come Walk With Me. Our women's ministry is sponsoring this activity for all ladies to come up to the site to just hang out, fellowship, connect with other ladies as they walk around the property. God has blessed us with over 30 acres right here in the Seton Business Park, and we're going to be utilizing that area on the 28th for Come Walk With Me at 10 a.m. So brothers, 9 a.m., we'll be in the banquet hall with Bishop. Ladies, 10 a.m., meet right at the Connection Center for Come Walk With Me. You can register for both of those on our church center site right now, newsalmist.churchcenter.com. And lastly, I want to give a special shout out today. This is a special day. I shared it on Sunday, but today is the day. My wife, Candace, and I are celebrating today our 10th wedding anniversary. So I want to give a special shout out to my wife, Candace. God has blessed me with her. We've known each other since we were 15. Wow. And we've been married now for 10 years. 
long time. We've been together and we have been blessed to be in holy union. God has allowed us to have three children. She's given me three beautiful babies. Ava, Joshua Jr., and Chandler, and I just want her to know how much I love her and appreciate her today on our 10th wedding anniversary. So I need you to, to write her a special note. She's been putting up with me for 10 years, so y'all keep her in prayer, living with me. But I thank God for her and thank God that he allowed us to find each other right here in church. We met in church. We met in church. One day we'll share all of that story, but we met in church in, as high school students and we've been together for so long and now married for 10 years. So I love you, Candace, and just want to give you a special shout out today. So let's prepare to jump into the word. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you today for the opportunity to gather virtually to study your word. Lord, we thank you that your word is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our pathway, that we continue to do our best to hide it in our hearts. And we pray that in this Bible study today, you would unlock new truths from your word that may help us as we walk this Christian journey, help us to understand more of who you are and more of what you want us to do as followers of Jesus Christ. In your son's name we pray, amen, amen. So go ahead, pull out your Bible app. If you've got it on your phone, pull out your Bible app and you can go right to the book of Acts. We're gonna pick up right where we left off this past Sunday in sermon entitled, Wait. So the book of Acts, chapter one, beginning with verse four. You'll see the scripture up on the screen. It's gonna be in the NIV version, the newer NIV translation rather. I'm gonna read it from my Bible as I, as, as I like to share with our discipleship classes. I still have my 1984 NIV. So some of my scriptures will sound a little bit different, but it's still the word. So verse four, on one, one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Our scripture text for the sermon on this past Sunday comes from the B portion of that fourth verse. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. So on Sunday, and I encourage you, if you haven't seen it again, go back to the YouTube channel, check out the message so you can hear the sermon in its entirety, and then also pick up where we jump right in in the cutting room floor Bible study. The sermon titled, Wait. We talked about how Jesus gives the command to his disciples and believers to wait in Jerusalem for the gift. The gift, that's the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Jesus has promised them that the advocate is coming to them. He's been teaching them about it for many years, for three years. He's been sharing about the spirit and he has promised them that they're gonna have it. They're gonna be do, able to do greater things than he's able to do. And they just now have to wait in Jerusalem. And in a few days, they will receive the gift, the spirit. This comes on the heels of the resurrection. In the book of Acts, the, the, uh, Luke picks up, because remember, Luke and Acts are a continual narrative written by the same author. Luke recount, recalls the story that Jesus shares in talking about waiting in Jerusalem. In the 24th chapter of Luke, he shares this story on the day of the resurrection. In Acts, it's one of the stories that's lifted in summary as we prepare for the ascension. And he's saying that Jesus has instructed them, stay here, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the gift. Don't go anywhere, don't go home, don't go out on the street, don't go on a trip, don't spend time getting yourself together alone and then come back to the group at some later date. He says, wait here in Jerusalem until you receive the gift. And so that waiting period is so important because the wait is the time of preparation. It's the time that they are getting ready for all that's to come. Because God is not calling them to a small assignment. God is not calling them to do little things for the kingdom. They have a great assignment, and a great assignment requires a great period of preparation. The greatness of that period is not defined in the length of it, but it's defined in its significance and the impact that it has to close out one chapter and prepare you for the next. So he tells them to wait, to be patient, 
and to be obedient. Patient, that is going to be some time until it comes, a couple of days. So you got to be patient. Know it's coming, but just wait for it. And to be obedient, this is the command to stay here and to follow directions. It's often said on the report card for elementary kids, elementary age students, that it says follows directions and it grades them on their ability to follow directions. And the truth of the matter is, as adults, oftentimes we struggle with following directions. I, I, if we were in service in the church, I would say, raise your hand. I want you in the chat. Say, if you know, if you know some other adults, I ain't going to put you on blast today. If you know some other adults that struggle at time to follow directions, just type in the chat, I know a few. I know a few. But even as adults, we struggle at times to follow directions. So Jesus is giving them a clear directive to stay in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes, testing their patience and testing their obedience, testing their ability to stay put and to wait and testing their ability to follow the direction to stay right here. Because patience and obedience are necessary for service of the Lord. Let me say that again. And if you're writing down notes, I want you to write this down. If you're typing in the chat, some of your notes, type this down. Patience and obedience are necessary for the assignment. And so the disciples have to exhibit patience and they have to exhibit obedience in order to receive the gift that's coming. And so we unpack that in the sermon. But today I want us to dig in a little bit more. One of the, the beautiful things about our cutting room floor Bible study is that we get an opportunity to take the sermon as a whole, to look at the text that gave rise to the themes and the topic, and then to dig in to see other pieces of the, the scripture narrative that help us in our understanding of the central message, also help us in our understanding of what God is saying, and help us in our ability to live it out in practice. So let's look at the text. We're in this first chapter of the book of Acts. Before I jump into to the text itself, for someone who may be a new believer, in the New Testament, we have one book of history, which is the book of Acts. We have our Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have the book of Acts. Then we have letters that are written from whether it was Paul, Peter, or others that give a practical working out of our theology, of our faith, of the church. So the, the Gospels give us the life and time of Jesus. They give us that, that background, the, new, the understanding of the formation of the new covenant from Jesus' birth through to his death and his resurrection. The book of Acts, the book of history for the New Testament, gives us a historical perspective of the interworking of the church from its founding right here after the ascension on the day of Pentecost, chapter 1 and 2, all the way through as it spread throughout the region, as missionary journeys are going forth, as leaders are persecuted, as new believers are coming in, as the cast of characters begins to shift from just the 11 apostles to others, to Paul and others. And so the book of Acts is that history book. And so our text today comes where we have now transitioned or making the transition from just the life and time of Jesus into the next chapter in the life of the Christian faith, in the formation of the church. And so chapter one of Acts, remember, again, Luke and Acts is our continual narrative. So the author here in Acts, now he's tying a bow on the life of Jesus, giving us one more, raising one more nugget of what he shared after the resurrection. As you read through, I encourage you to go back, read through the entire first chapter. Luke starts off talking about how Jesus rose from the dead and showed himself. Luke, a physician, showed, he, he said he gave proof, evidence that he was indeed alive, that the Jesus that died on Calvary rose on Easter Sunday and is the same Jesus that's appearing to them in the flesh, saying, hey, I'm real. You don't have to believe this having never seen it but the same guys you guys were with me in the garden y'all y'all saw me crucified now I'm back so I've given you evidence that I'm back and Luke gives us one more story Jesus is instructing them in our text 
to wait here in Jerusalem. I'm going to say that again. Luke, of all of the things that Luke could have given voice to in this first chapter of Acts, as he is now transitioning from sharing of Jesus' life to now sharing the history of the church in its formation, Luke gives rise to this story when Jesus said, do not leave Jerusalem. Let me say that again. Jesus says, do not leave Jerusalem. So let's pause right there. It's a small part of this of this story and narrative, but it is very important. And I can't stress this enough. Every word, every line, every punctuation mark of scripture is significant and carries meaning. Jesus says, do not leave Jerusalem. Why didn't Jesus instruct them to go home? They're not from Jerusalem. He could have said, y'all go on back home. We down from the Galilee region. We, we not folks from the big city. We down from these little, little other towns where people look down on. Let's go back down there. Y'all hang out for a little bit. You know, people gonna cook for you. Mary and Martha are gonna take care of y'all. Let, let, let's just hang out for a little bit. But instead, Jesus says, no, don't leave Jerusalem. What is significant about Jerusalem? So Jerusalem is capital city, city of David. This, this, this is the place where David's throne resided. He was here in Jerusalem. He built the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus has come on the throne of David. This is the, the center spot of the Jewish faith. It is in Jerusalem, specifically in the temple, where the Jews believed through Old Testament theology that the spirit of the Lord literally resided there. So this is Jerusalem. Everything, as you read through the Gospels, builds towards Jesus getting to Jerusalem, almost as if to say, that everything he did outside of Jerusalem was great to establish and to to be in the early stages. But when he got to Jerusalem, that's when stuff got real because Jerusalem is the capital city. That's why the events of Palm Sunday were so significant because Jesus rode into the capital city with fanfare, with celebration, with people yelling, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was significant because it was, he was coming into Jerusalem. And so Jesus is saying, y'all stay here because Jerusalem is the center spot of everything. It's the hub of worship. It's where Jews from all over come to really worship in the temple. If you, if, if for, those, for, for you Bible scholars and, and for those of you who who may not be Bible scholars, but you say, I want to learn more about about the word. As you read through the the books in the Old Testament, it's specifically 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings. As you start to get towards the end of 2nd Samuel and then into 1st Kings, when the kings start, Solomon and then his sons and, and then so forward, start to move Israel away from their monotheistic full understanding and start to allow other gods to take place. What you start to see here are temples that are erected in other parts of Israel where other gods are worshiped. Before, in the days of David, then in the days, of specifically the earliest days of, Saul, of, of Solomon, rather, before some of his heart started getting turned in some other ways and some other things started happening in the kingdom, which is another Bible study. All of the worship took place. You had you came down to the temple in Jerusalem. But as their minds started shifting away from God, from monotheism, and they started allowing other gods in, then they started allowing political power to make them divert their attention from centralizing down in the southern kingdom, down in Jerusalem. They started building other temples in other parts of the kingdoms where they started turning their eyes away and God did not recognize nor honor that because their temple, the hub, the place that was recognized as the place where the presence of God resided was in 
Jerusalem. So Jesus is telling them, his believers now, to stay in Jerusalem. Stay here. Don't go anywhere else, but do not leave Jerusalem. And so it's important to understand that this is the place where they need to be. This is the place, and and to unpack this a little bit more as well from Sermon Sunday, this is the place where the Spirit is going to be sent to the believers and the church will be formed. It is not somewhere else. It is in Jerusalem. This will do a couple of things. One, it will put them in the best possible place to have exposure to other Jews. Because Jerusalem, that's the hub. They are all coming into Jerusalem. And so Jews from all over are coming to Jerusalem. Jerusalem puts them in the best place for other Jews to be exposed to the Holy Spirit when it comes. Second thing is it also gives credibility to the movement. Credibility to the movement because it takes place in Jerusalem. So it doesn't look necessarily like something different. It, it, the persons don't have to get word of what happened down in, in, in Nazareth or what happened down in, in Bethlehem, but they're getting word in Jerusalem, the hub, the capital city, the center of commerce, the center of economic power, the center of religious establishment is the place where the spirit is going to fall on them. And so that's why I believe Jesus says, wait here, because the significance in Jerusalem is that it will allow you to do more and the spirit to be exposed to more people on day one. So he says, wait in Jerusalem. So whenever through scripture, specifically in the Old and even in the New Testament, Jerusalem, always remember, Jerusalem symbolizes that hub. Jerusalem symbolizes that capital city, making it up to Jerusalem, the holy city. That is the place, a sacred space, to bring it even to the modern day. Oftentimes you'll hear, for for those of you who who stay up on, on word events and so forth, many of the struggle, much of the struggle rather, that takes place between the Israelis and the Palestinians, though it is a lot deeper than just this on the surface, much of it resides around the holy place of Jerusalem. Who has access and rightful ownership and authority over the holy city? And and for those of you who have traveled to the Holy Land, you know, as you travel through old city Jerusalem, you find that in different parts, in different segments, it's controlled by different, whether it's the Israelis or the Jews. And it's because to both of them, it's seen as the holy place, the most holy, one of the most holy places. So Jesus is saying, you guys stay here because this is a recognized holy place. And what's going to happen is really, as Jesus said, fulfilled filling what has already been foretold. The Spirit will be poured out in Jerusalem. The Spirit poured out in Jerusalem. So whenever you see Jerusalem, understand, it's signifying that this is a holy spot, that this is a special place, that there's something other about here. This is not just one of the other towns around. This is Jerusalem, the holy city. And so it's significant that they wait in Jerusalem But then another thing that's very significant that I want us to spend some time unpacking. Jesus says, wait here. You will receive in a few days. You'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Says in a few days. As we read through, we understand that the few days was referring to Pentecost. It was on Pentecost when the Spirit fell. They didn't know how long then. They didn't know if a few days was one or two, they didn't know if a few days was 30 or 40. They, did, they had no con- context to understand how many days they would indeed have to wait. 
They just knew to wait. What was also happening as we shared Sunday is that their waiting was also aligning with God's preparation for what it was he was calling them to do. That sometimes our wait is not just for us, but our wait is also for the rest of the story, the rest of the picture, the rest of what God is calling us to do to be lined up as well. Sometimes that's God causing us to wait until the people we're called to minister to are ready for us or the people we're called to serve to are ready for us. In a relationship, that may be God saying, I'm holding, you're not going to find the person yet because the person I have for you isn't ready to receive what you have yet. They're not ready to be in a relationship yet. I'm working on them so that when the time comes, both of you will be ready for what it is I'm calling you to and what I'm blessing you with. And so while, while the disciples are getting ready, they got some work to do. <clears throat> they've, got, they've got to be prepared and, 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 and understand how to work through what they've been through and get ready for what's to come. At the same time, God is getting everyone else ready and bringing them into town for Pentecost. So let's talk about that. Pentecost is symbolic because it's 50 days for us on the Christian side, 50 days after the resurrection. And there are three significant moves for us to understand as Christians. Resurrection, 40 days later, the ascension, 10 days later, Pentecost. Resurrection, Easter Sunday, 40 days later, ascension, 10 days after that, 50 days from Easter, Pentecost. It's significant to understand that each of these are taking place in a sequence. So let's look at it from a, a, as they lived it in that time. Easter Sunday, Jesus gets out the grave. He appears to them. Maus Road walks through walls. He eats with them. They, they, they see that he is alive. Forty days after that is the ascension. So for 40 days, Jesus is in the flesh teaching having conversation with his disciples and believers. After the resurrection, we do not find in Scripture any account of revivals. We don't find Jesus going on a world tour showing, get this, to those who wanted him dead that they failed. Now, now I, I'm going to pause right here because I, I, I think this is important. For many of us, if we were Jesus and folk literally called for us to die, we were victims of public execution. And then we got up three days later. I don't know about you. I'm, I, 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 I would like to say I'm, I'm holy. I, I'm, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I, 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 I'm sanctified. I like to say all of that. But I think there's a part of me that would have said, let me go by and hang out with some of those who are calling for Barabbas. Let me just go drop in on a meeting of, uh, of the centurions that divided up my clothes and spat on me. Let me go down to, to, to Pilate and just wave at them so they see that I'm here. That's what I would have done. Now, now, now I, I, again, I know we're in Bible study. If you know you might have had to go show yourself to some of the folk who, who, who did you wrong, I want you to just type in the chat, yeah, I, I, I would have done it. I would have done it. Don't, don't try to be super holy today. Tell the truth. Shame. As the old folks say, tell the truth. Shame the devil. I would have gone and said, all right, yeah, I'm going to let y'all see my resurrected body. I'm going to let you see where you put them nails in my hand and my feet. See the, the little scars that I got from the crown of thorns. I'm going to let you see all that. But for 40 days, we have no record of Jesus going to show himself to anybody. Instead, he spends time with the believers. And I believe that this is preparation for his ascension. Jesus has 40 days on this side of, of the tomb, on the empty side of the tomb. 40 days to get them ready for what's to come. Then they have, this is the wait, 10 days 
to process everything, to figure out what we do next, to figure out, as Bishop preached um, some time ago, what just happened, to, to get all of that in the right order, because 10 days after, the Holy Spirit's fallen on Pentecost. So there's a sequence, resurrection, ascension, Pentecost. Resurrection, ascension, Pentecost. And it's important for us as we understand and read through from the end of the gospel of Luke and the other, of the other gospels through the resurrection and then into Acts that there's a sequence taking place and that each step, each point is significant, one, to prepare you for the next. So they have to wait now between Ascension and Pentecost for the Spirit. That's their time where they transition from Jesus in the flesh to Jesus sending us the Spirit. And this is important. They have for three years been under a physical, fleshly bodied Jesus leader. He's been the one who goes before them. He's been the one that responds to the questions of the Pharisees. He's been the one that makes something out of nothing. He's been the one that walks into the towns and has people saying, come eat at my house. That's been the physical Jesus that's been with them. That same Jesus was with them for 40 days after the resurrection. But now they have this 10 day period from Ascension to Pentecost to get ready for the next step, which will require them to be led by the spirit. And it's important that we see these transitional moments that the Gospels, Jesus led ministry in his earthly form. Now we get to Acts and on even into the present day. We are walking under his direction, under the guidance of the Spirit. So they've been waiting for Pentecost and each moment required that there be a wait. Took them 40 days after the resurrection with Jesus in their midst. 10 days after the ascension, working it all out while they're waiting in Jerusalem. And then the spirit came. And so as we, we go through and, and, and we're going to step a little bit outside of just our text, because we understand that at the end of at the beginning of chapter two, on the day of Pentecost, the spirit fell. They were all in one place and on one accord. Then the spirit fell. And that is what they were getting ready for. That was the moment that they had been prepared for. It was for Pentecost. And then from Pentecost on, the Spirit gave them direction. And the Spirit led them. The same Spirit that was in Jesus came to rest in them. But as we, as, as we look at it, we understand that these disciples on Acts 2 are the same cast of, 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 of folk that we find in Luke 23 and in the garden. But in Acts 2, they're standing with authority, standing with confidence. Luke 23, they're running away. Don't look like they can start anybody's church. But it was in the waiting period that they had time, and somebody get this, they had time to grow. Acts 2, Peter standing up there preaching, preaching the greatest sermon, thousands getting right. They all coming down to the altar saying, what must I do to be saved? Luke 23, they all scattering, they all running. It's the weight that gives them space to grow and to mature. And so when I laid out those three different markers, they are symbolic of moments in the journey 
that we can track our growth and maturation. As we are on this Christian journey, we should always be able to look back at significant moments where we saw God do great things, where we experienced things that we could have never imagined that also then caused us to grow in our Christian maturity. The maturity from resurrection was learning to believe that Jesus could get up from the dead. Now, that, that's a hard one to really understand. They heard him preach about it. They saw him raise other folk, but they didn't understand how he could raise himself. And so they say, well, how are you here? And it took 40 days to work that out. And now they got to the point, get this, where now him leaving again no longer frightened them. Him leaving this time, they said, okay, we ready for the next step. Then the 10 days from ascension to, to oh, Suri, Suri wants to get in on the lesson as well. Then to, to understand that, 10 days from ascension to the falling of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost was the time where they began to understand now it's time for us to grow and be proactive to get ready. 40 days from ascension, we don't hear too much about the actions they took. We just know they spent it with Jesus. 10 days, ascension to Pentecost, they filled Judas' seat. They were all together in one place on one accord. They were constantly praying, trusting God for whatever was to come. The same folk that when Judas showed up ready to sell Jesus out, they scattered. But over this journey, they matured and they were ready for Acts 2 to stand when the spirit fell. So Jesus gave them instruction. And I, I believe that the instructions that Jesus gave them and that he even gives us are so significant because we don't understand all of where we're going. But if we follow his instructions, we will get there just fine. Jesus tells them, do not leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So let's unpack that. He says, John baptized with water, but in a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's telling them that uh, 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 another baptism is coming. John baptized with water. He took people down the Jordan River. He was out in the wilderness and folks would come out to him. They heard him preaching a message of repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand, that there was something getting ready to happen. Remember, this is the teaching that gives, that breaks up the 400 plus year silence that is found in the gap between the Old and the New Testament. It's this strange man out in the wilderness, a man, uh, uh, it, to use the depictions that you see in, in some of the the biblical movies or reenactments or so, this old hairy man that just eating bugs and berries out here preaching a message of repentance and telling folk they need to be baptized so that their sins might be forgiven, that it, they got to repent and be baptized, that you got to say, I, I, you turn away from your old ways and go down in the water. That's what John was preaching. But Jesus is saying, now there's coming another baptism by the Spirit. And not only is Jesus teaching this, but John also taught it. And so again, remember, as we said, Luke, Acts, continual narrative, same, same author. In your Bible app or in your physical Bible, I want you to turn to the Gospel of Luke and go to chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, and it's here that we, we learn about John preparing the way for Jesus. 
I want you to go with me down to verse number 16. In verse 16, we have this. John answered them all. Uh, let's, let's actually drop back verse 15. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John is the one coming to prepare the way. The people are thinking maybe he is the one. Verse 16, John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will, will come, the throngs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So Jesus is saying here, Acts 1, John baptized with water. Y'all about to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John foretold this to anybody who had questions that maybe John was the Christ. John said, no, nah, y'all, I'm just here preparing the way. But there's one coming who's holier than me, who I'm not worthy to even touch his feet. He going to baptize you with something that I can't. I'm going to baptize you with water. Water is symbolic. Water is an outward, you're showing the world the inward change that you've made to repent of your sins. But there's another coming who's going to baptize you with the Spirit. That's not something that can be done by man, or get this, or something that can be instructed or command, commanded to happen by man. He's coming, and he's the one that will initiate your further baptism, which is a baptism by the Spirit. So let's talk about baptism. You've heard us say it, Baptist Church, we believe in two ordinances, the ordinance of Holy Communion and the ordinance of baptism. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. We believe in baptism by immersion. We take you under the water and bring you back up. If you go to a Baptist church and you're able-bodied and able to, and they don't dunk you all the way under the water, say, y'all need to dunk me again, because we go full immersion. Your whole body goes under the water, bring, come back up. That's baptism by full immersion. That's what John did. That's what John did to Jesus. He baptized him by immersion in the Jordan River. That's what Jesus commands us to go ye therefore to all nations, baptizing persons in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism by immersion. But here, Jesus is talking, saying, you've been baptized by water, but there's another baptism, which is baptism by the Spirit. Water baptism is symbolic. Spirit baptism is transformative. Somebody write that down. Water baptism is symbolic. Spirit baptism is transformative. You, you're baptized by water showing what you have made a decision in your, in your heart. Spirit baptism comes when the spirit is now say, taking up residence fully in your life. You're no longer the same. And it's a complete immersion of the spirit. That's important. Jesus is telling them, in a couple of days, you're going to be completely immersed by the spirit. This is not going to be a flyby spiritual descension descending on you. This is going to be a complete transformation of who you are because the spirit is completely falling on you. The spirit ain't falling on you halfway. The spirit is completely falling on you when you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about spirit baptism, water baptism. Water, water baptism, pre-Pentecost. Spirit baptism, post-Pentecost. Water baptism, outward activity. Spirit, activity. spirit baptism, an inward establishment of the spirit 
coming in and taking over your life. Believers experience baptism of the Spirit differently. Sometimes in, in different reformations and, and different denominations have different interpretations. Adults who come to faith, you're, 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 you're an adult or even a youth in, 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 in some areas, high school students, middle school, so forth, that come to faith oftentimes may come through their spiritual baptism. They've learned about this Jesus and they've had some encounter where now the spirit has taken over their body, not in some way uh, where you see people just moving around or acting uncontrollably. No, that, those are things that are taken out of other cultures and contexts and sometimes try to fit into our language to give visual representation of what we read in the scripture. The spirit, and I'm, I'm going to debunk somebody's theory today. The spirit does not come on you and cause you to just start acting crazy. That's not the Holy Spirit. There's no understanding of the spirit coming on folk and they just start acting crazy and wild and, and just doing silly things. That ain't that. That, that may be some other spirits. That may be some spirits you got, got from a store on the corner. But that ain't the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit coming on you is when the Spirit essentially, at, to use to Jesus' words, baptizes you in itself in such a way that there is some level of response that I would proffer and argue and, and, and put out for our discussion and conversation. Some way that brings you into a keen awareness of God's goodness. And get this. And simultaneously gives you an awareness of the fallacy of your human nature. The spirit baptizing you is an instant where you experience the total, the, the, as much of the goodness of God in you that you can possibly comprehend because the goodness of God is so immense that we are incapable of fully downloading all of the data that's in the picture of who God is. That's the isness of God. Our processor can't compute that much because God is just so good. But when the spirit comes on you, you are completely overwhelmed when you're baptized in the spirit. You're overwhelmed with who God is and the fact that you have he has deposited you some of himself in you while at the same time you start realizing I'm not worthy of this. I, I, I have flaws that that should disqualify me from this that that and, and this is a word if if you if you are baptized by the spirit and you simultaneously are not aware that you're not worthy something's wrong. Because none of us are worthy to receive it. That's the goodness of who God is. Is that he allows us to be baptized by his spirit, even when we in and of ourselves are so unholy that the spirit should not be able to reside in us. Now, now this, this Trinitarian theology. But because of the gift of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can now become vessels that the spirit can live and dwell in because Jesus has covered our sins and washed them away and paid the price for them on Calvary. And so remember, early, remember that the whole lesson works together. Resurrection, ascension, Pentecost. Pentecost comes after resurrection. Resurrection is the last step of the process that seals the payment for our sins. So when Jesus died on the cross, he died and bore the sins of the world. When, his, when he died, all of our sins were paid for. But when he rose, we regained power and authority over them because Jesus' resurrection showed the enemy that though you thought you killed me for sin, I got up. So now you don't have the power. I got the power. As, as the old preachers would say, 
when Jesus on, he, he was in the grave, but he went down into hell, ran a revival and stole back all the keys of death and destruction so that when he got up, he had all power in his hand. And so he has now that sin has been paid for. The sin problem has been atoned. 40 days he's been teaching and preaching and sharing with his disciples about who he is now on this side of the resurrection. They've got 10 days to get ready because the spirit is they're going to be baptized by the spirit. And that baptism, the spirit will come in them, come on them. And this simultaneous awareness of who God is. Simultaneous understanding of the flaws and the the inherent sinness of our human nature and the gratitude that the spirit can come on us because of Jesus's work on Calvary. So I'm pause right there. So when you see people or hear people talking about, yeah, the spirit came on me. I started shouting. I started doing this. I started doing that. The spirit doesn't make you shout. It is the awareness of how good God is that prompts you to have some type of physical response. That's why. And and it's a some of this is also cultural for us in our African-American tradition. When we are in a moment of excitement, when we are in a place of joy, we don't stay still. When when the music gets good. Your foot starts tapping. When, 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 when food is good to you, you start saying, mm. You know, the, 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 the old black folk, you would say, sit at the table. You know when the food good because they're sitting there rocking. Because you just can't stay still. There's some physical response. For us, oftentimes in church, sometimes in your car, sometimes in your house, when, when you start thinking about how good God's been, you just have a response. What they call a quickening or a Baptist fit, you just start shaking because it's not the spirit making you do it. It's your physical response to the thought of just how good God's been. So the spiritual baptism is us being filled with that spirit. And that looks different for different believers. For some persons who come to faith at a young age, you may not understand it totally yet. But there may be a point and oftentimes it's been shared and and it prompts a lot of people to be baptized again, to say, I want to get baptized again by water because I have a different understanding. Now, when you get to that place of realizing of how good God is, how flawed you are and that God is still using you, that God is still keeping you for those who come to faith at a younger age, it may look different, but it's the spirit coming on you and completely saturating the entire the entirety of your essence that now I am completely allowing the spirit to lead me and to guide me. And so we have to understand, don't get caught up in the gifts of the spirit, whether that's speaking in tongues, whether that's prophecy whether that's the ability to preach or teach. Don't don't get caught up in the gifts of the spirit as being the only indicators that someone has been, quote unquote, baptized by the spirit. And again, this is we're sharing this from a Baptist theological lens for for those who may be in other denominations or other reformations. Some interpret it differently. For us, we don't look at the gifts, the outward expression of the spirit as indicators of the presence of the spirit. But rather, we believe that the spirit, spiritual baptism is available to all believers so that even if you don't speak in tongues, that doesn't mean you don't you haven't been baptized by the spirit. Even if you can't walk around and look at somebody and tell them, as Bishop would say, look at somebody and tell them what they ate last night and what they're going to eat tomorrow. That doesn't mean the spirit has not baptized you. 
I would argue, and, and I would, 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 would throw out for our consideration, that spiritual baptism is not solely identified and measured through someone's ability to operate outward gifts of the Spirit. But rather, spiritual baptism is really discerned in someone's ability and willingness to allow the Spirit to lead them and guide them. That allows the Spirit to be the one that tells them where to go and what to do, tells them what to say and how to say it. That is the mark of spiritual baptism. Because even when you look in as we travel over in the second, second chapter, Peter stands up. They've all been talking and speaking in tongues, but they have not been speaking in the tongues that you may hear in, in, in a, a charismatic worship service that, that is a spiritual language. They've been speaking in tongues that is the language that other people hear. And that's why the crowd was gathered, because they hear all these people talking in their language. They say, how do they know? How, how do I understand this? Y'all not from where I'm from. Y'all shouldn't be able to do this. But the Spirit enabled them. And then when Peter stands up, the Spirit guides him and gives him what to say and what to do. Indication that he's been baptized by the Spirit. And so, so often some of these things can be buzzwords and explosive words. And as you're growing on your faith journey, you'll hear people saying, oh, I've been baptized by the Spirit. And you feel a little bit inadequate because you don't understand it. Don't look at it as if it's something that's a hierarchy of levels of faith. There is no hierarchy of levels and, and levels of faith. We are all seeking to work out our soul salvation. We are all in the process of being sanctified. Ain't none of us reached it totally yet. When we reach that, we'll be on the other side of the Jordan. But when you hear people saying this, don't get caught up in persons using spirit baptism as a measure of your Christian growth or where you are on your journey. Understand that Jesus is saying here that the spirit's going to baptize you when the spirit comes on you and you allow the spirit to be the Lord and director and the conductor of your train and the guide on your journey. And so he says, understanding that you're going to be baptized by the spirit in a few days. And lastly, last piece, I, I got to go. I want y'all to tell Bishop that I went over my time today. The spirit is coming and this wait period, this 10 days from Ascension to Pentecost is the time that they're getting ready for the spirit to come on them. The Holy Spirit is promised in a few days. And the Holy Spirit, somebody, somebody right, get this. The Holy Spirit was the missing piece for them to start the church. The Holy Spirit was the missing piece for them to start the church. Let's expand that. When we do the work of the Lord, we must be led by the Spirit. Jesus tells them to wait until the Spirit comes on you. The Spirit was the necessary ingredient to continue the work of the Lord. So whenever we are doing the work of God, we have to allow the Spirit to lead us. There should never be work done for the kingdom that is missing the spirit. There should never be service for the kingdom. There should never be witnessing for the kingdom. There should never be worship in the kingdom that does not, that is not led by the spirit. Because without the spirit leading it, it's really service done for man. And so Jesus is saying, wait here until you have the spirit. And once the spirit comes, you will have the key that unlocks the next chapter of your journey. 
Can't unpack that as much as I want. But I, I just want to, 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 to reiterate, the Spirit's arrival unlocks the next chapter for the journey for these believers. And for each of us, it is the Spirit that's the key that takes us from place to place in God and unlocks the next chapters in our lives so that wherever we go, we are led by the Spirit. The weight, as we, as we come to a, a close today, the weight is our opportunity to be prepared. It's our opportunity to get ready for what's to come. But most importantly, it's our opportunity to allow the Spirit to take the wheel. And for the train to go, the car to go, where the Spirit wants it to go. If we go on our own, if we decide not to wait, we will go sometimes in places that God doesn't want us to. But if we wait and allow the Spirit to guide us, wait for that Spirit to come. In whatever situation you're in, wait for God to send the signal that it's time to move. When we do move, everything will be prepared for us that we can continue to do the work of the Lord and continue to have God's favor rest, rule, and abide on us so that everything that we do works together for good and that the blessing that God has intended for us will stay on our lives because we are operating under the covering, under the obedience, and with patience and allowing the Spirit to take us everywhere we need to go. So that's all I have for today. I got to quit. I'm right at my time. Somebody tell Bishop, send him an email, say Reverend Joshua finished right on time tonight. I'm not going over anymore. I'm closing right there. But there's so much here to unpack. I, I, I love sharing in, in, in Bible study. And even as we prepare our offerings, we're going to bring our gifts in just a second. I love sharing in Bible study because there's so much to learn. And regardless of how long you've been on the journey, every time you open God's word, there's something new. And you rob yourself of the opportunity for God to speak to you if you never get in a posture for him to fill you back up. And that's why I love Bible study. I love listening to Bible study. I love sharing in Bible study because even in my preparation, God dropped new things on me that I, that I had never seen. Read this chapter, read this passage tons of times. But every time we read it, there's something new that God has for us that helps us in that season of our lives to get where he's calling us to go. So let's prepare now to bring our offerings, our gifts of love. We can give them electronically, Givelify, through PushPay, through New Psalmist's website. You can text your offering. We want to be a blessing to the kingdom. There's a lot of things happening here at New Psalmist, and we're looking forward to all that God's going to do. I've enjoyed this time today. I hope that this Bible study has blessed you. If you've been blessed by this Bible study, I want you to write, write in the chat, say, Preacher, this helped me. Send this link out to somebody else. Share this. It'll be living right on YouTube so that you can come back to it. And as Bishop would say, chunk it out. Go back and listen. Little piece here. Little piece here little piece here, so that you can continue to grow in your faith and your understanding of God's word. So let's pray. We're going to close in prayer, bless our offerings, and then prepare to be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for our gifts that we bring in tonight. We ask that they may be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. And Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity to gather in study. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this manual known as the Bible, that you allow us to read it. Lord, we even thank you that over 600 years ago or so, that it was translated and printed and put in forms that today we can open it up on our devices. And wherever we are, we can always have a Bible with us. And we thank you for that. We ask now, O oh God, that the words that have been lifted tonight might seep down into our spirits, that we might understand them more and more each day, that we might trust you enough to wait and believe you 
for when it's time to move. We thank you and praise you for all that you're doing. And we ask that you will continue to bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Take care. I hope that you enjoyed Bible study tonight. Again, thanks for hanging out with us in the cutting room floor Bible study. Make sure you go back on YouTube. Check out the sermon. Check out some of the sermons Bishop is sharing through the end of the, chat, the book of Luke that lead us right to this passage that we study today. And looking forward to seeing you here in worship at New Psalms. Have a good evening. Take care.